Hi everyone, in this lesson we will talk about emotions and emotional intelligence. For most part, we are not really familiar with what emotions are or what does emotional intelligence is. Have you ever heard of the, of the abbreviation EQ? Perhaps most of you are, have heard already but to, do not really know what the meaning is. Perhaps you know IQ. IQ is easy to understand, but when we say a person having a high IQ, he or she might be intelligent or knowledgeable. But when we say EQ, how do we expect a person to act like if he or she has a high EQ? But what does EQ mean? It's emotional quotient. It is a measure of the extent of our emotional intelligence. Now. The real question is, what is emotional intelligence and how can we picture out a person with a high or even low emotional intelligence? These are the things that we, need to, we will talk about here in this lesson. But first of all, we need to understand what emotions are. Alright? Okay, so let's begin. What is emotion? Of course, it's a common phenomenon for each and every one of us. Just look at the picture. The picture itself will say what emotions are. Be it happy, be it sad, be it uh, angry, or be it neutral. But more than this, more than uh, associating emotions with what we feel, there are so much that we need to understand about emotion. But first and foremost, we need to understand that emotion is our mind and our body's integrated response to a stimulus of some kind. Well, of course, when you say stimulus, it's anything that triggers a particular reaction. And in this case, we talk about a stimulus that triggers a mental and physical reaction. Simultaneous mental and physical reaction. Now, emotions involve physiological arousal, expressive behaviors, and conscious experience. Now, just a segue, uh, perhaps many of us are not really familiar with the study of emotion because we are, again, we, as a society, we are much more focused on IQ or our in intellect or intelligence. Say, in school, how many percent of our school activities are focused on EQ compared to IQ? Perhaps you can say that 95% of our school activities or even the subjects are focused on IQ rather than EQ which tells us that as a, as a society if a school is a training ground for real life or for the future uh, adult life then perhaps as a, as a society it implies then that we give more importance to IQ more than EQ. However, there are researches and, uh, or even there are testimonies from successful people were interviewed and none of them really attributed their success to IQ. Perhaps, of course, I, I'm not saying that IQ is unimportant, but IQ is really so important. But what these people are saying is that uh, in the course of the, roads to the road to success, what really counts most or what really matters most, that thing that really brings you towards success is EQ or emotional intelligence. The way we handle our emotion, later on we'll talk about the components of emotional intelligence and the like. But here we need to understand why is it important to understand emotion? Why is it important to handle our own emotion? Because these are very vital if we really want to achieve success or even happiness in life. Alright, so let's proceed to the formal discussion of emotion. So first, Let's talk about the components of emotion. So, as mentioned a while back, there are different components of emotion. First is the physiological or the biological component. Second is the behavioral component. And the third is the cognitive component. We'll talk about them one by one. So, let's start first with biological component or the physiological arousal. A very important physiological basis of emotion is this thing called as reticular activating system. So the reticular activating system, or commonly known as the RAS, is a set of connected nuclei in our brains that is responsible for what we focus on. 
The reticular activating system is best known as a filter because it sorts out what is important information that needs to be paid attention to and what is unimportant and can be ignored. So if emotion is our body and mind's in reaction to a particular stimulus, how many stimulus do you think are present or are, are, and are at play as of the moment? Say for example, you are sitting now watching your computer. What are the potential stimulus? Can your computer serve as a stimulus? Yes. Can your, the, the chair that you're sitting on now be considered a stimulus? Yes. Uh, can you consider your mother cooking at your kitchen today a stimulus? Yes, the food. Yes. Now, there are countless of stimulus that are at play as of the moment. But the question is, why do you think we are not reacting to each of these stimulus? If there are, say, one million stimulus present as of the moment, because it even includes your memory and the like, or uh, the way you, uh, yeah, your memory. No, if there are a lot of stimulus as of the moment, then how come you are not paying attention to each of these stimulus? The answer is, it's because of your reticular activating system that filters out those stimulus that may not be necessary as of the moment that only focus on the things that you deem as important. So because of which, focus and attention and concentration is possible because of the reticular activating system. We only choose to react to specific and necessary stimulus. So... Uh, how does the RAS related to emotion then? Well, of course, later on, we'll realize that emotion always starts with an arousal. And again, RAS is responsible for arousing our physiological system. Well, RAS is more than just a filter, but it is a set of nuclei connected to many parts of our nervous system that is also uh, connected to many parts of our body. It is connected to the amygdala, connected to the, uh, the higher uh, higher nervous system or those uh, related to our executive functioning. It is also connected to our memory, connected to our senses and more. So when it comes to emotion, we only emotionally react to those, those things that we filter and we focus using our RAS. Thus, you don't emotionally react to your uh, sister uh, nagging about her boyfriend if in the first place you don't focus on her. You are more, much more focused on your assignment or listening to this lecture. Or you may not have the same reaction as your friend watching a viral video because unlike you, she is more focused on the video and you are focused on other things. So in this case, we only have emotional reactions, emotional triggers based on the things that we focus on using our RAS. But then again, uh, RAS and emotion can also have some vicious cycle, wherein if we feel an intense emotion based on the things that we focus on, th that our emotion also has a capacity to cloud our RAS or our focus and attention to the point that it is hard for us to concentrate or to be attentive when we are feeling intense emotions such as anger or such as loneliness. That is why it's hard for us to study math or it's hard for us to study our lessons before the exam if we are feeling uh, emotionally distressed, like being angry about your, uh, about your girlfriend or boyfriend or about your situation or being lonely because uh, of something else family problems perhaps, All right? So these are just some, uh, this, this is just a brief discussion about the biological component of emotion. But of course, there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of things that we, we have not discussed yet here in terms of the physiological component of uh, emotion. But what we are after here is just to understand the reason why we become emotionally aroused in the first place, and that is the RAS. Next. Next, let's talk about the theories on emotion. 
So there are a lot of theories on emotion here, and these th theories revolve around this question. How do thinking and feeling interact? Which of these comes first? Do these bodily reactions come as a result of the thought, or do the body reactions trigger the thought in our brain? So these are the questions that we need to answer using the different theories of emotion. First in line, we have the James Long's theory. I don't know how to pronounce that Lange, James Lange or James Lang. I heard uh, people saying Lang, but uh, uh, anyway, let's, this is developed by William James and Carl Lange. It argues that our experience of emotion is our awareness of our physiological responses to emotion arousing stimuli. It suggests that emotions occur as a result of our interpretation to physiological reactions to events. In short, this theory suggests that there is no such thing as emotion without physical reaction. Emotion is nothing but a physical reaction that we have we just interpreted. Say for example, you are hit by your friend and that stimulus being hit by your friend triggers certain physical reactions. Say for example, uh, uh, increased heart rate, uh, the increase of the cortisol level in your uh, biological system, uh, the rising of blood into your to your brain and the like so these or uh, increased body temperature this series of physical reactions when interpreted produces emotion so say for example uh, upon feeling these different body reactions we then tend to interpret oh my 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 uh, temperature is rising my uh, cord Cortisol is uh, rising as well, increasing, heart rate is increasing, I must be angry. Well, it might not be practically sound, but uh, that's how these theories propose emotion. That it is nothing but our interpretation of the physical reaction brought about by an emotion arousing event, such as being hit by your friend, right? Next in, next in line is the cannon barred theory, which is a bit a reaction of the first theory, which suggests then that, uh, of course, is developed by Walter Cannon and Philip Bard. And the theory states that an emotion arousing stimulus simultaneously triggers physiological responses and the subjective experience of emotion. Sabi nila, of course, it's quite impractical the anger as an emotion follows the path suggested by James Lang when anger occurs in a very very quick manner so it's hard for us to feel in anger in a very quick manner when in the first place we, need, we still need to interpret the uh, the certain physical reactions that is brought about by the event so it may it might be theoretically sound but in reality it may be odd so canon bard suggested another theory which states that upon the event say for example being hit by your friend the the subjective uh no, the, the physical reaction such as increased heart rate increased body temperature increased cortisol level simultaneously happens on the subjective experience of being angry so you don't need to interpret these physical reactions for you to be angry because being angry and feeling all these physical reactions happen at the same time. They have an ex they have an exclusive existence with one another, right? So Canon Bard suggested that the experience of emotion was not dependent upon interpreting the body's physiological reactions. Instead, they believed that the emotion and the physical response occur simultaneously, and that one was not dependent upon the other. Okay. So next, we proceed to the Schachter-Singer theory or commonly known as the two-factor theory and of course from the name itself it is developed by Stanley Schachter and Jerome Singer and this theory states that to experience emotion one must first be physically aroused by an event second interpret both the event 
and the physical reaction. So, an event happens, say for example, being hit by your friend again. And then that, that event uh, triggered a series of physical reactions such as, again, uh, increased heart rate, increased body temperature, increased cortisol level. So, this is the physical reaction. Now, for an emotion to be produced, we need first to interpret or our body automatically interprets the physical reaction or the physical yeah the physical reaction such as those that I've mentioned and of course the context of such reaction which is the event and the background happenings or the environment where that event happens for example say for example being hit by your friend and it triggers a particular reaction physical reaction now you interpreted the reaction as being angry perhaps angry but on top of that you saw that 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 action of your friend was not really intended to hurt you but is intended as a humorous act because by virtue of your friendship so in that case it you have interpreted that you might just be excited perhaps uh, just just simply aroused so in that case you you don't get angry but you just get excited Dead. and of course uh, perhaps that event instead of triggering a chaos perhaps trigger a more friendly interaction say for example you also punch him and hit him at the same time and you both laugh laugh and both uh, and started a conversation and the like and whatnot so then again the two-factor theory suggests that uh, for an emotion to occur, we must have an interpretation of both the physical reaction and, of course, the event that triggered that physical reaction. Simply feeling arousal is not enough. You also must identify the arousal in order to feel the emotion. The immediate environment plays an important role in how physical responses are identified and labeled as such. Now, I don't know with you, but uh, perhaps you may be thinking about... Uh, the practicality of these theories do we really need to interpret first a physical reaction before feeling an emotion or are physical reactions really important in upon in talking about emotion in the first place because for all we know in practicality or in, in the actual situation we just feel and we just have emotion without knowing interpretation and the like but perhaps these theories if you read them uh, further perhaps suggest that it's not really a conscious but perhaps also includes unconscious interpretation of these uh, physical reaction and so much of these uh, theories by the way I will include in this uh, video a link a YouTube link that further discusses the differences between these, these theories later on we also talk about uh, the Lazarus theory which may might be considered as the fourth wave of emotional theory but uh, for this time let's proceed first to the behavioral component of emotion now then again when we say behavior that is the manifestation or that is the primary output of attitude so anything that can be measurable anything that can be observed that is behavior the, the way you sit perhaps you're sitting uh, in sideways that is a behavior perhaps frowning that's a behavior uh, talking out loud that's a behavior uh, being immobile or being uh, moving a lot of ways while listening to this video is a behavior as long as it's observable that is behavior okay so what is the behavior component of emotion now of course you know this man Charles Darwin who suggested that emotions and their expressions are innate and evolutionary evol evolutionarily adaptive there is an explanation to emotion based on the theory of evolution saying uh, when Darwin published his book uh, emotion expression of emotions in man and animals he argued that all humans and even other animals show emotion through remarkably similar behaviors for Dar Darwin emotion had an evolutionary history that could be traced across cultures and species course that that was an unpopular view at that time but say for example perhaps our uh, our ancestors may have learned 
how to express behaviorally these emotions in order to survive or in, for, adapt, uh, for adaptive purposes. Say, for example, our ancestors may have learned how to frown in order to uh, suggest being lonely or being sad so that first, they may signal other people to comfort them, which may be adaptive because when people comfort you, we become more happy, we become more satisfied and fulfilled, and as a species, may, may facilitate the propagation of species or the existence of those species. Because when people learn how to comfort one another, they give, they give support and higher chances of surviving. Or say, for example, yeah, our ancestors may have learned how to express an angry face or an angry behavior to signal to the other person that, hey, I'm angry and you should not disturb me. And so that the other person may have also learned how to interpret such behavior so that he or she will not disturb him and thus will not uh, resort to a fight with that person, thus uh, maintaining peace with one another uh, propagating individual survival and of course propagating collective survival because when people are generally at peace with one another the more chances of that civilization or species or tribe to uh, survive and thrive or save for other animals as well so our, our ancestors may have also learned how to interpret the behaviors of other animals in terms of the emotions that they feel so for example if you can see a dog wagging his tail of course it means that the dog may be happy and ready to play but when does the the tail is stiff and the dog's face is uh, of course scary because you can see those teeth you can see those eyes then perhaps that signals our ancestors to back out and not to disturb again that animal or, what. or say for example when an animal is afraid the higher chances that uh, that animal may be hunted or be ready for food for dinner and of course we know that how ev evolution works is that uh, this has been passed to us from generations to generations through biological blueprints in our dna now aside from uh, the evolutionary uh, explanation of emotion other experts also suggest that the, the expression the behavioral expression of emotion may vary from culture to culture so that one culture may have a different way of expressing anger with another culture. Say, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the Ilongos, but I'm not really sure about this. I just heard this from my friend, that when an Ilongo gets angry, unlike a Tagalog, he or she might soften more his or her voice. Say, pag sa Tagalog, pag sinabing, papatayin na talaga kita, papatayin kita, ha? Most likely, papatayin ka because you heard him saying that word in a very frantic, in a very violent, in a very loud way. But for any longer to say, papatay na talaga kita. The, the softer it is, the higher the chance that you will be, that you will be killed. I'm not really sure, but uh, that's what I heard. Another uh, example is uh, there are cultures that when they are so happy, they tend to sing. And uh, there are also cultures that when they're happy, they just, they just don't show it. So, in connection with that, let's proceed to the next topic, which is, of course, expression, facial expression. According to Paul Ekman and Carol Ezert, they conducted a study demonstrating cross-cultural agreement in judgments of emotion in faces by people in both literate and preliterate cultures. And they found out that there are seven universal emotions that have the same expressions and these are of course the following joy surprise contempt sadness disgust anger and fear so across cultures though they vary in uh, the way they express emotion when it comes to facial expression you can really uh, interpret what he or she feels based on how he presents these feelings in his facial expression. So joy, ito mga ito, these seven emotions have uniform uh, expression across cultures based on the study of Ekman and Isaac.
Now, we also, Ekman discovered that people have micro-expressions in addition to macro-expressions. So, macro-expressions typically last between 0.5 to 4 seconds and involve the entire face, such as this, these macro-expressions. But micro-expressions go on and off in the face in a fraction of a second as fast as 1 to 30 of a second. 1 thirtieth of a second in the attempt to conceal emotions, micro emotions can happen so fast that one cannot recognize or see them easily. Perhaps micro expressions are the behavioral expressions that we tend to hide so that people might not interpret our emotion. So, for example, in the Philippines, where uh, we are, we are people who are always hiding our true emotions. That uh, when we are afraid that people might judge us to be angry. So instead of being angry, we show a smiling face, we show a, we show a very polite face, only to find out that when the person is gone, you're really frantic and you're really, you're really angry about that person, you talk behind that person. It's not good. So macro expressions are the conspicuous uh, emotional expression compared to micro expressions that we tend to conceal and thus are not readily interpreted because they happen so fast okay so let's proceed to the cognitive component of emotion subjective labeling ever wondered why uh, the same event or the same stimulus may trigger different emotion say for example a viral video may be funny to me but maybe uh, maybe uh, gross to the other person Perhaps a, uh, a line of 7th grade or 75th grade may be a, a disaster for me, but may be a paradise for another person. So this is what we call as the subjective labeling or the com cognitive component of emotion. So in short, emotion is subjective. Again, going back to lesson 2, which we realize that uh, feelings or emotions are connected to our thoughts, the way we think affects the way we feel. So the way we believe or the way we perceive a particular situation or a particular event triggers different emotion. So emotion directly is connected to how we perceive a particular event. Let's say for example, watching a viral video and you perceive that video to be funny because a person is being slapped at or the person uh, as a uh, person's face is so funny so you think of it as very funny that therefore the way you feel also coincides with what you've perceived the event to be so in that case you also feel uh, happy you feel joy you feel uh, humorous and the like whereas if you interpreted such situation as gross perhaps uh, it might uh, in your mind it uh, violates human rights and you have a lot of uh, contrary perceptions about what you just watched then and of course it might trigger uh, negative emotions as well such as perhaps angry being irritated or annoyed about that video and the like so according to Lazarus of course you know you knew Richard Lazarus in our lesson 6 about stress uh, Lazarus shown that the experience of emotion depends on the manner in one one appraises or evaluates an event he implies that emotion might be predictable or in some point controllable so sometimes people might not be true when they say what can i do i'm just feeling this what can i do i'm just feeling angry what can i do uh, some some people would say that emotions are uncontrollable but based on lazarus theory it can be controllable it can be controlled by just changing your thoughts about a particular event. So say for example, you, uh, you experience a very uh, traumatic experience like uh, being uh, having a broken relationship with your boyfriend or your uh, special someone. Some people will normally uh, interpret the event as a very tragic event uh, to the point that they uh, cry a lot for one week and the like. Some people will even not eat. Some people will uh, some people may uh, that event may affect 
to that people's study or work to the point that some people may even commit uh, things that may be dangerous to them. But other people, but uh, the question is, do we really need to feel tragic when uh, we, we have these kinds of uh, situation like being uh, having a broken relationship with your special someone? Some people may say yes, because what can we do? This is how we feel. But Lazarus would say you can control how you feel by changing your perspective about that situation. Situation that instead of seeing that situation as tragic, why not see that situation as a significant event that can really give you a lot of lessons? Say the lesson you may uh, you may learn from that event is not anymore to trust uh, someone hundred percent or not to give, to invest all your feelings to someone 100% and just feel okay. You know? If you just see the, the positive things that may, uh, that you can acquire from that particular situation. So in short, if you want to have positive feelings all the time, always see the positive events, the positive sides of every event, no matter how negative it may be in general. Okay, so those are the components of emotion. Now, are, are you ready to learn more about emotions? So if, that is, if that's the case, let's talk about emotional intelligence or EQ. So now you can see in this picture an iceberg. I don't know if you have already uh, seen an, an actual iceberg, but uh, a for what we know, uh, this is the reason why the Titanic sunk. And that's the reason why Jack and Rose uh, had a very romantic yet a very tragic ending. So as we can see, 10% of that uh, iceberg is the only ones, the, uh, the ones that seen on top of water. The rest of the 90% is hidden underneath. Now, as you can see, the, the the smaller portion is being associated associated with IQ and the higher portion is as, being associated with EQ. What does this picture mean then? It might mean that uh, commonly IQ is the one being focused and EQ is being forgotten only to find out that EQ comprises more or uh, is more responsible for a person's success or functionality or even performance compared to IQ. Well, then again, we are not saying that IQ is unimportant. We are just saying that it is the right time for us to also consider EQ because um, then again, there are researches that shows how successful people associate their success with EQ rather than IQ. And we all know that the road to success is one hell of a ride when uh, uh, we experience a lot of mistakes, experience a lot of setbacks, a lot of failures. Now, it's not about the, the, the extent of our knowledge or the way, uh, the, the how capacitated we are in our intellectual capacity, but it's about how we deal with these uh, painful and tragic situations and get back up. So, EQ is all of those things. Now. Didn't you know that, uh, just a trivia, emotionally intelligent people usually become leaders and are effective in their work as well as in relating with other people. Why? Because a person high in EQ or those emotionally intelligent people knows how to understand and express themselves, to understand and relate well to others, and to successfully cope with the demands of life. To understand more emotional intelligence, let's talk about the different components of emotional intelligence. And here we have five, okay? So we have social skills, we have self-awareness, self-regulation, motivation, and empathy. So let's start first with, uh, yeah, we'll talk about each of these components. Now, in short, if we want to increase our emotional intelligence, we need to increase all of these components in us. Good news, fortunately, these components or emotional intelligence or can be developed it can be increased it can be improved how through constant practice just like any other skills or any other any other skills or intelligence it needs to be practiced for it to be perfected or for it to be developed 
okay? just like our IQ EQ can also be improved so let's start first with self-awareness so self-awareness means the ability of a person to tune in to his own feelings so aside from knowing your weaknesses your strengths knowing your boundaries knowing your capacities and the like self-awareness also includes being confident and being in touch with your feelings a self-aware person does does not deny his feelings a self-aware person does not repress his feelings because uh, a self-aware person is aware with what he or she feels and is confident about it the problems of most people is that they try to repress and deny their feelings only to find out that this kind of uh, coping mechanism will result to more problems because according to Sigmund Freud any repressed feelings are not forgotten but uh, then uh, placed in our unconscious and may manifest in different ways may manifest into some psychological outputs or psychological outcomes or worse even physical outcomes so say for example if it's a very negative experience because of a very negative a negative feeling because of a negative experience is most likely if you repress it it is hidden in our unconscious and may manifest in many ways such as personality problems or worse physical illnesses so in order for us to take control of what we feel first is we need to be aware of what we feel and being aware of what we feel implies that we need we need also to be confident about it so say for example you're angry you don't say I'm not angry you don't resort to reaction formation or uh, hiding your emotion but you you do proper ways to control or regulate your anger but first we need to recognize that we are angry because once you don't recognize it the feeling of anger will stay in you or worse is it becomes nurtured and it becomes part of our personality so i have a tip for you for, uh, one way for us to control our emotion is first to name it we need to be uh, effective in how we name our feeling so instead of saying i am angry say instead i feel angry instead of saying i am sad i am depressed say in, say i feel depressed i feel sad because by virtue of saying i feel instead of i am you are not identifying with your feeling but then you recognize that there is a separate existence between you and what you feel and the natural tendency of your feeling is it just comes and it goes it does not stay unless if you want it to stay if you nurture and you ruminate it every day then it stays but if you just let it be recognize its existence and allow it to pass by then that's how you control the feeling but first you need to be aware and you need to know how to effectively name what you feel next is self-regulation this is the ability to control disruptive impulses caused by negative emotions so again we don't need to be shy or feel sorry about what we feel or how we feel so that's the way we feel it if you're angry you don't need to be sorry about it if you're sad you don't need to be sorry it's just how you feel but then again according to Lazarus you can control what you feel but in the case of actual feeling actual uh, experience of feeling it then you don't need to deny it or you, need, you don't need to be sorry for it but you need to be sorry when for instance you have done a very negative behavior or negative action based on what you feel in that case that's a different story you may not be sorry about how you feel but you need to be sorry about a negative behavior you have done in line with what you feel in that case you cannot justify your action based on your feeling say uh, for example you cannot uh, justify uh, hitting your classmate just because you're angry or you are being angry in that case it is your fault that you have hit your classmate it is not your fault to feel angry but it is your fault and you are accountable with what you did because of what you feel so there is needs to be as you need to regulate how you feel or what you are what you could do because of how you feel a highly intelligent person 
knows how to regulate his or her feelings. Okay, another, another tip is, uh, for example, if you are feeling intensely angered or feeling intensely sad, now instead of uh, impulsively do some actions that you may regret afterwards or, uh, in, uh, or to avoid uh, doing very uh, impulsive behavior, uh, when you feel something, an intense emotion just like anger, stop. You need to stop, be silent. Find a way to be alone. Find a way to uh, detach from people because uh, most likely these people might reinforce our feeling uh, even if they don't mean to. Try to be alone, perhaps in your room or perhaps in a chapel or perhaps in the CR and just Again, going back to self-awareness, just be aware of what you feel, name what you feel, just relax. Um, second is to observe your bodily reactions and find a way to relax. But the rule of the thumb is never ever ruminate about that negative event or it might reinforce or it might nourish the, uh, the negative emotion. Just focus on the present moment, just focus on your breathing focus on yourself but the most important thing is recognize what you feel and just accept it as it is and allow it to pass by feelings just are just like passing wind that when handled properly just comes and goes it stays when you ruminate about it okay so just allow it to pass by no need to fight it no need no need to uh, Deny it, just recognize it and allow it to pass by. So that's self-regulation. Another important component of emotional intelligence is motivation. An emotionally competent person can motivate himself to work because he has a positive attitude in life and knows how to and knows or has clear goals. Okay? So many of us uh, are waiting for motivation to come. Just to a particular task, especially those heavy tasks. Say, for example, doing a thesis or doing a project. Most of us wait until the deadline to really uh, exert much effort to finish the project because we have spent a lot of time before the deadline just to wait for motivation to come, only to find out that motivation does not come, but motivation is created by us. Okay? So an emotionally intelligent person does not wait for external motivation to come, but has the capacity to create motivation from his inner self. One very important factor to increase or induce motivation is to set clear and meaningful goals. Okay? So uh, I don't know if you have uh, watched that commercial in uh, Nescafe asking para kanino ka bumabangon or para ano ka bumabangon or what's the reason why you wake up. If there's no reason at all, then it's really hard for us to, motiv to be motivated in life. But if you have a clear and meaningful goal, say for example, I'm doing this for, uh, for my family, I'm doing this to serve my society. So if those are the kinds of goals that you have, and it is clear to you, and clear in your mind, not just vague. Say, saying, I want to be happy is very vague compared to saying, I want to do this to be happy is different. So you need to be clear about your goals and make sure that it is a meaningful goal. Okay? And that's the case. We have motivation. So a person who is emotionally intelligent has high motivation because in the first place, he or she has a clear and meaningful goals. Okay? Next, we have empathy. So empathy is the ability uh, that helps one to recognize and understand how other people feel. Now, sympathy may be different from empathy because sympathy just, just uh, implies knowing what the other person feels but empathy is feeling what the other person feels so it's literally or not literally it's uh, metaphorically putting yourself into the shoes of other people knowing where they're coming from knowing uh, how painful it is to lost love a loved one knowing it is how to fail in a particular subject 
knowing it is how to feel joyful when you have a newborn baby so this is empathy feeling what other people feel now why is empathy very important towards the road so of success and happiness because going towards the roads to success and happiness involves a lot of social skills people skills uh, you are not going there alone you're going collaborating with people you're there you're having teamwork and if you don't have empathy it's hard for you to be with people it's hard for you to uh, to maintain an authentic friendship without empathy it's most likely when two people misunderstand one another, conflicts arise. I mean, and conflicts usually means uh, a rift in your relationship, especially when it is not uh, handled well. Okay? So we really need empathy to uh, induce understanding with one another. Okay? Next is social skills. It's usually referred to as people skills because they can influence, communicate, and lead. A person with a high emotional intelligence is a person who is comfortable dealing with people. Even if you're introvert, doesn't mean that you are allergic to people. No, it's not natural to be allergic to people. Being introvert is natural. It's good to be an introvert, to be silent at times and most of the time and be alone. But it does not mean that you need to be allergic to people. You need to know how to handle people. You need to know how to influence, communicate, and lead people. Okay, so then again, uh, going back to our uh, discussion, uh, the roads towards success and happiness is always a community, a collective endeavor, not just a, a solitary endeavor that you do alone. You need other people, you need other uh, professionals, you need to collaborate with others in order to reach success and happiness. In that case, we need to know how to, comfort, to be comfortable and to... Uh, to deal with people with different personalities, with different backgrounds, with different experiences. So that's social skills. Now we have completed the five components of emotional intelligence. So emotional intelligence, if you want to increase it, we need to increase these five components. Okay? So what I want you to do is uh, in your journal, you may uh, list these five components and you may rate yourself from 1 to 10 depending on how much you are how, how much you are exhibiting these five components of intelligence. But I hope uh, we don't give up on ourselves. We always practice. We always uh, give hope and give time to ourselves to increase and to, uh, to develop all of these components so that we can achieve what we call as emotional intelligence. Not just IQ, but also EQ. Because by the end of the day, if we really want to become successful, to be happy in life, we need to also increase EQ aside from IQ. And improving it requires that we need to understand emotion, we need to understand how we deal with emotion, we need to understand what happens to our body when we feel emotion, and we need to understand how to increase emotional intelligence by increasing these five components in us. All right. So thank you very much for listening and hopefully we will see each other soon with our next lesson. Thank you.